I'll really go into uh, the first panel. I'm still ahead of time a bit. That's very good. Um, I'll just introduce briefly uh, all the panelists so that you can locate them around the table. Uh, we have first uh, Florian Stahl and Stefan Burgmeier representing the OWASP Top 10 Privacy Risks Project. And they will tell us, uh, can you just uh, make yourself visible for a moment? Okay. Uh, then Hannes Jofenik from ARM now, who's uh, deeply involved with the uh, uh, IETF and other internet activities. Jens Kubizil, QB from the Tor project. Rob van Eyck from the Dutch Data Protection Authority. Joss Wright from the Oxford Instant Internet Institute. And uh, Stefan Petitcola from CNIL, the French uh, Data Protection Authority. Um, the first, we, the, this first round um, is titled uh, Where are the gaps between the existing tools and initiatives and what people actually need? And um, so each of the panelists has, is either deeply involved in a project which addresses the issues that they have identified or has re done research on where the issues are and what could help or has done a specific, also practical work on data protection and privacy deficiencies of existing tools. And so um, we'll uh, all go into that one. So the format of this panel is that uh, each panelist, and Stefan and Florian count as uh, one in that respect, has uh, time for a five minute introduction and then we will immediately open the floor to everyone to ask questions. And um, as a rule of thumb, a question should take less than one minute to ask. And uh, <laughs> um, we, will, we will close this, this panel with a round of answers by the, the panelists, which will then respond to all the issues that, that have been raised. It's, it's a format which doesn't allow to go very deep into the matter in this panel, but we have more time of discussion, uh, in particular in the afternoon, to explore those matters uh, that are um, here. Um, my colleagues, uh, Gabriela Zanfir and uh, Snezana, um, are very well organized, and so they have uh, promise to make us benefit from this by keeping the time. So uh, uh, speakers, when they see that they move and pull one of the green cards, uh, then it's time to come close to an end. And when you see the red card, then it is time to really end uh, your intervention. Um, and um, for those outside and listening uh, in via the live stream, uh, on the same page on the EDPS web uh, site where the live stream is, there is the, uh, um, a window to connect to the chat channel, which we have for free note on this event. And uh, my colleagues will follow this channel and will also read out any questions that come in through the chat channel so that they can also be brought into the discussion. So with that, I uh, stop with the technical uh, announcement. And um, I invite um, uh, Stefan and Florian to uh, take us uh, through their presentation, which is coming up on the, on the screen behind me. Um, most of you will know OWASP, the open, well, I think no one knows anymore what the uh, acronym actually means, but... Uh, it's, uh, on, it's on the slides. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it will be somewhere on the slides. But uh, it's very, one, uh, the, the top 10 security risks uh, list, which is published every year, is one of the best known resources in the, in the field of uh, security problems, and it's like about a year ago that uh, these two guys with other volunteers have started working on identifying the top 10 
privacy risk, and which is, of course, a very valuable project also to, to make it clear that uh, uh, privacy is more than security. And with that, uh, the floor is yours. Please. Okay. Thank you very much, Achim. So, as Achim already mentioned, my name is Florian Stahl. I'm coming from Munich, working as privacy and security consultant for MSG Systems there. I'm here together with Stefan, a uh, master student of the University of Applied Sciences Munich, or actually not anymore, he handed in his thesis yesterday. Um, yeah, and we're just going to give you a brief overview of uh, the OWASP Top 10 Privacy Risks Project. So uh, we can go to the next slide. And some of the background, um, Achim already mentioned OWASP is mainly known for its top 10 risks of uh, security, security risks for web applications. It's kind of a standard already in many companies uh, for many people. And actually it's a bit more than a year ago that uh, I was wondering um, that there is no such a risk list for privacy risks and it would be nice to have such a, such a, such a list. So uh, that's the reason why we founded the uh, OWASP Top 10 Privacy Risk early this year. And its goal is to identify the most important technical and organizational privacy risks for a web application. So it doesn't only focus on, on technical issues. And it's mainly uh, thought as a guidance for developers' architecture, but it could also be used as a checklist for users of web applications, also for legal departments, what risks they have to consider when dealing uh, with uh, web applications, which privacy risks. So actually, the project so far was quite a success. We had nearly 100 privacy and security experts that participated in discussions and so on. We had a survey on the frequency of uh, risks, uh, of general risks in uh, web applications that 62 people participated and uh, IPAN also liked what we were doing and uh, Achim contacted us and asked us if we don't want to join him in uh, organizing the Internet Privacy Engineering Network and also bringing in our results. Um, we don't have the time now to go uh, uh, too deep into the method, but uh, we published um, the first version of our top 10 privacy risks um, last week, so and I just would like to give you a brief overview about them. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, and these are the top 10 risks so far. Um, the, the first risk is web application vulnerabilities. Um, this is cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and all these things. The uh, second uh, rated risk is operator-sided data leakage. So this is a wide area. It uh, includes like insecure servers, back-end systems, uh, excessive administrator access and things like that. Um, the third risk is insufficient data breach response. Uh, this are, uh, covers measures after an incident like taking an web application offline or informing uh, users about uh, the data leakage. Um, the fourth risk is insufficient uh, deletion of personal data, that uh, personal data is not deleted <coughs> completely, not at all, or not uh, securely. Um, the fifth risk is a really organizational risk, that uh, there are non-transparent policies, terms and conditions, so that the um, user is not aware what happens with his or her data. The sixth risk is a uh, collection of data not required for the user consented purpose. For example, that a web shop um, collects data about browsing behavior and um, location data that the user is not aware of. Seventh risk is sharing of data with third party that uh, do not have control or appropriate um, privacy and security measures. Data that is not up to date anymore, incorrect and therefore um, the ninth risk, uh, quite interesting one, I think, the web applications do not have, uh, do they have hidden logout button or not a really automatic data like uh, forever. And uh, last but not least, uh, the, uh, the risk number 10 is insecure data transfer. It's mainly um, about, uh, yeah, not sufficiently encrypted uh, transmission of data. View of our project. I think there is some time for uh, questions later on, and yeah, I think I have hand back to Achim. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Stefan, Florian. And the next speaker is Hannes Jovenik, uh, who has been introduced already several times uh, today. So I just uh, give him the floor to make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ayn. Um, I have one slide only and try to focus on one specific part of this whole technical ecosystem, namely the standardization. Um, not only because I'm most familiar with that part, but also be because I think it's, a, it's of vital importance for um, today's internet, because otherwise, without standards, we wouldn't be uh, at the place where we are today. Like, and here, in particular, I focus on standards developed by the Internet Engineering Task Force, but also uh, standards developed by the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, the approach that was uh, taken in the IETF uh, initially was focused on security when people realized that that's, uh, the threat models change, the size of the, the Internet changes, and so various different documents, and I, I put them on the slide for you to look up, uh, have been published that provide guidance on doing a threat assessment and uh, common security services and also mit mitigation techniques. Um, so standardization uh, participants are supposed to uh, look at those and follow those. And uh, it's fair to say that today you can't really uh, design a new technology, a new protocol in the IETF without any uh, thought about security. So you have to provide some, um, also in, in form of text in a special uh, security consideration section, a discussion of what the threats are and how you mitigate them. And if you don't mitigate them, you need to have a good story on why you aren't doing that. Um, that obviously created the need to provide some, to have education. People are more aware of security today than they were uh, 10 years ago. Like there's a, uh, I think we are doing pretty well on the security in terms of understanding um, and also in, in capturing some of the, the issues and, uh, in the standards development. That doesn't mean that um, everything is great as you've seen uh, before the, the news last year, Snowden and so on. So even if you have everything perfectly well documented, it's a separate story on how things are implemented and deployed. Um, um, and so we took that pattern and uh, tried to apply it to privacy because that security work obviously was a little weak on the privacy side. Um, and even terminology was confusing, uh, let alone the guidance. And so that was... Uh, what the IEB, the Internet Architecture Board, had been working on and published with this RFC 6973 um, to sort of go through a list of uh, comprehensive uh, sort of guidance and discussions. It doesn't have specific mandate on what you have to do or you, what you uh, shouldn't do, but instead it, um, the idea is that you as a standards uh, protocol developer, you are supposed to think about these questions and come up with a story, write them down, what you thought during your design. So as you see, in both cases, the audience is really the standards group and the standards participants. Uh, it doesn't provide a lot of help uh, for, let's say, implementers. You will not learn there on how to implement a certain functionality in Android or um, iOS or wherever. Um, so that's just uh, without this, outside the scope. You could call it a gap. Um, but it's just a way of uh, how these different groups work. And more recently, um, a couple of people have uh, moved over to the W3C to actually do a similar exercise there because they had taken earlier work from, from the IDF on the security side, and now they uh, look into privacy as well. It's a group chaired by uh, a person from ISOC, uh, Christine Runiger, and a person from Apple, Daryl Whalen, uh, that uh, many of you are familiar with. And the group also, in addition to writing a, such a privacy consideration document um, tailored to the web protocols, it also um, aims to do privacy reviews, um, which I think is obviously quite important, not just letting people uh, do their own stuff, but then also double check it with privacy experts uh, looking at the document and trying to figure out whether the main issues have actually been uh, captured. And um, that's going on in that group as well. So 
I think from an, I think it's a, both of those activities in the IDF as well as in the W3C are important efforts that are being uh, picked up in other organizations um, and hopefully we'll see more awareness within the standards community when it comes to designing privacy into, into technology. Um, on the other hand, as we've seen already with security, um, stopping there is, is not enough um, because you need to then follow the chain that happens afterwards from implementation to deployment to have uh, um, enough guidance for other communities, for other audiences. And um, that's where I hope we, we see some follow-up activity. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hannes. Yeah. And uh, the next speaker, basically, uh, his T-shirt says it all. Uh, and I saw the beautiful green T-shirt with a big onion on it. So uh, there was no doubt who would represent the Tor project today. Jens, please. Thanks. Yeah, um, as you already said, my name is Jens uh, My The main task when it comes to the Tor project is uh, that I'm running an uh, association besides of the Tor project. It's called uh, torservers.net. It's a German association. We run it with uh, three persons. And what we do there is uh, we uh, operate Tor servers, Tor relays, Tor bridges throughout the world. And that uh, the reason is that the Tor project should have some high capacity relays. Um, and that, that's what we are doing here. So I think the good point when it comes to Tor that everyone has heard about Tor in a more or less way. I think Tor is quite well known, well used, and also a well researched project. However, Tor has seen quite uh, a lot of ex uh, development over time. And I will give you a, just a wrap up what I think what Tor is right now and what the development uh, was over time and how it maybe improved. So, the, uh, the original design uh, was made more than 12 years ago. Uh, basic idea was that we have some set of relays and the traffic of a client is, went to those relays and um, builds up of some older ideas. But how does a relay know about, uh, how does the Tor client know about relays? And the answer here are the so-called uh, directory servers, directory authorities. So first, a Tor client went to a directory authority and says, well, give me please a list of all Tor relays which exists in the world. It gets this list and selects then three relays from that list and negotiates the um, uh, key with the first relay, builds and secured encrypted connection to it and then extends it to the second uh, relay and then to the third relay and uh, then goes up to the uh, normal internet. So that's the basic idea which uh, is behind Tor. It was a little bit changed over time. Several researchers found attacks against it, but uh, the basic idea uh, is the same. But on the user side, uh, the user got the software, the Tor software, had to download it and in the first place you have to download it and uh, configure your browser, set up a SOX proxy and that worked a little bit and some people found out, well, the early versions of Firefox do their DNS requests uh, away from Tor, they don't use Tor for DNS requests, so when you, even if you use Tor, your provider could see which sites you're browsing. So another part of software came into the field called Prevoxy, which uh, prevented those DNS leaks. And But also this solution had some weaknesses. Then the Tor button was developed. This was an, a plugin for the Firefox. And now we are at the point that when you go to the Tor website and click on download, there you get a software called Tor Browser Bundle. And it's a, a modified version of Mozilla. Uh, this is maintained by the Tor project. Tor project did uh, at the beginning uh, very large work in threat modeling, try to address uh, security and privacy risks. And now they uh, use the Firefox, patch it, and try to uh, secure them against those risks so that the user, when, the, when it uses this uh, uh, Tor browser, uh, can be sure that there are no uh, leakages, nor no linkability, etc. Um, well, that's the 
the user side, that is what the user thinks when he sees Tor, but over the years there were another uh, development, uh, there was another development we saw. Uh, several countries in the world uh, started to block information, started to block websites, and uh, well, Tor was quite usable to circumvent those censorship and lots of research and development got also into uh, circumvention work. So bridges were developed and bridges are, to simplify a bit, like a, a hidden entry point into the Tor network. Um, those bridges were not public visible. You had to uh, go to a special website or write a special email to get those informations. However, those uh, like big censorship countries, China, etc., were able to find out large number of bridges and the design was a little bit changed. Uh, we now have uh, so obfuscated protocols which also resist active attacks from China and uh, enable users in very uh, uh, in countries with a high amount of censorships to get free information. And all those things, the Tor browser bundle, this uh, censorship uh, solutions and Tor itself uh, is now built in into the Tor browser. You can just download it, enable it via click, and that's what the user sees and what he thinks of Tor. But besides that, um, there is, uh, for instance, uh, there are another uh, sub-project, for instance, the or bot or web. This is an application for Android for the handy to uh, give the user, how to enable the, the handy user, uh, mobile user to um, surf anonymously in the web. There's, um, we measure censorship events, there's a project called Onionu. Um, there is uh, Tor metrics where you can find some information about the current state of the Tor network. And also for researchers, we have a test uh, network, so software where you can build up test networks to test uh, some specifics of Tor inside your uh, lab and don't use the public Tor network. So this should be a short picture from my side of Tor. I'm open to question later on. Thank you very much, Jens. Uh, the next speaker is Rob van Eyck from the Dutch Data Protection Authority and also an IT person by his genes, I would say, or uh, at least as far as you can, to the extent that you have it under your control, and also deeply involved with developments at international level uh, by representing the Article 29 Working Party in the W3C DNT Working Group and lots of experience on internet uh, privacy. Rob, please. Well, thank you, Achim. Um, well, I have a background in electrical engineering, and my main reason for starting with that study was to try to understand the world, because the world is quickly changing uh, and embracing a lot of technology. And the thing with uh, new technology is that it's important to understand what the nature of technology is and how it evolves. Um, so, Massimo, you can switch the slide, please. Um, and when I came to data protection, this was just in 2010, uh, I was amazed that, that what, this was a really completely new world for me. I, I, after electrical engineering, I, I did a lot of in project management. I was involved with building no, new technology and implementing it also at the big uh, telcos. Um, and, and there, of course, you see different people in different roles. You, um, before I, I get to the informational privacy, uh, I, I want to hook on what Hannes said, is that there are a lot of groups involved with creating technologies. They all have their different roles and functions. Uh, people who design protocols, they have different language, they do different things than people who design applications. But then again, there's another big important group that's often left out in the technology and privacy discussion, and those are the business architects. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to them in the end of my slides. So. Having all these different people uh, around at the table is important to uh, avoid miscommunication and therefore it's, it's good that a lot of standardization work has gone into uh, a, a key set of um, terms, a key terms, was, and one of the big terms of course is what do we mean with privacy, what do we mean with security. And there's a long established um, uh, historical debate that started with the Brandeis already in uh, 1890 and the informational privacy uh, basically, uh, from the legal point of view, in the EU uh, and also the OECD guidelines of the Second World War, um, touch upon the fact that we're talking about human rights. Um, 
it's, it's, it's like the introduction of the camera, which um, the reflex was we don't, do not want to be uh, photographed, which is still uh, an important reflex in some cultures, especially in Asian cultures. There are people like, uh, that they do not want to have their picture taken. Um, so, it's, so from the, the perspective where you're living, it's important to take into account what is the, the basically the effect of the technology that's having on the society. So the, the human rights for privacy stem from a basic respect for, uh, for the private and family life, for the home, but also for the correspondence. And we, we've seen with the pervasive monitoring that uh, uh, privacy is a broader thing than security alone and the ability for others to snoop into a correspondence um, has set off a, a lot of uh, anger and rage and uh, misunderstanding all around the world. So it's not for a, a, any reason that uh, security does take a very important place within uh, privacy thinking. And about 10, 15 years ago, and Mr. Hurstings knows more about it than I do, uh, the pets community was very busy with introducing privacy enhanced technology and, and you, you could say like, like the TOR project is, is, is like a pets technology and uh, tries to establish secure communications between uh, somebody who is sending information and somebody who is receiving. Next slide, please. So the nature of the data from an engineering point of view is an important thing. Um, but if, talking from uh, an enforcement perspective or from a legal perspective, the, the data is, is neutral in, in itself. What's interesting is, from a, uh, if you take a few steps back, is to see what, what you're actually doing with that data. So the purpose of the data is taken into account, and that's where the business architect has an important role to define what is the, the, the purpose we want to uh, use the data for, and within what context. So it, it's to give meaning to the data. Um, and elements that, uh, when you do like a privacy impact assessment to identify risks, uh, in um, correspondence with like the, the, the family life or with the, uh, uh, with, with you, the personal life, you see <coughs> elements coming in that relate to the person's health or the economic situation. It's all very sensitive elements that um, if, if that information gets misused for different purposes or gets in the hands of uh, others, that the information was not intended to can cause harm to the individual. <coughs> Next slide, please. So often when I um, discuss with uh, engineers, uh, when we're uh, doing an appraisal of the technology, um, we start by looking at the data flow. Where is the data coming from? When data is collected, and what is the data, how is the data going through the system? Where is it stored? <coughs> and it's important to understand that the, uh, the privacy is, is contextual and not the same everywhere. That means we have cultural differences, there are differences in, in uh, legal frameworks, and there's a global competition on new technology as well. And the compliance is therefore uh, a challenge. <coughs> Sorry. Please, next slide. I have one minute left, so. I wanted to point to some work of the Article 29, um, and especially some of the um, opinions that uh, the group has been working on for the last two years. Um, there's a lot of guidance in these opinions, a lot of practical use cases as well, and uh, I invite everybody to, uh, to, to become familiar with these use cases because they may become very helpful in trying to understand each other and trying to make sure we work on the, on the same uh, things. So the purpose limitation opinion, anonymization techniques is a very recent one, the legitimate interest and the uh, uh, application of the necessity and proportionality concepts are all opinions that have been established in a consensus between all the uh, member states and uh, well, <coughs> sorry, I'm having a little bit of a bad throat from uh, last night. <laughs> So the emphasis is on the use cases, um, and uh, they try to explain that within different contexts, privacy can have different meanings. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Rob. And um, yeah, we'll see more of your uh, perspective uh, this afternoon in one of the uh, challenging conversations, as I would, would call it, but uh, come back to that later. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Josh Wright from the Oxford Internet Institute. He's a researcher uh, uh, known for his interest in cryptography and privacy-enhancing technologies in particular. Josh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have come to this from a slightly um, eclectic background in, in a variety of different projects to do with, with, with privacy um, from the work at the OII. Um, the OII, for people who aren't familiar with it, is actually a, a social science uh, department at the University of Oxford um, that looks at the internet from a variety of different angles, from economic, um, sociological, psychological, um, political science aspects of the internet. Um, I'm a computer science hiding out in the social science faculty there. Um, in the time that I've been at the OII, I've worked on a number of projects related to privacy, um, which has worked um, on, in everything from doing privacy impact assessment work for EU surveillance projects um, through uh, advice on ethical and privacy enhanced handling of data for big data projects like the, um, the, the Google's measurement lab. Um, I also took part in, in the Europrize scheme, which I haven't heard mentioned so far in, in, in the technical discussions today, but the Europrize is a, a privacy seal um, developed within Europe that can be awarded to institutions or technologies to, to certify that they are um, developed according to privacy best practice. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to focus on a specific project. I thought I would I talk a little bit about the, um, the general feeling I have about the technology and the problems that we have with it. Um, and I think that the title of this, of this session is, is, is very apt, which is the focus on the gaps. And I think it's, it's worth remembering that um, the gaps in our models are nearly always where, where evil occurs. Um, it's, it's not individuals who are sitting somewhere making evil decisions in general. It's when people are making perfectly reasonable decisions, but in an institutional structure, the gaps between those decisions and the misunderstandings between those de decisions are what causes, are what causes problems. Um, so in thinking about technologies and approaches to preserving privacy, um, I think there are a number of significant gaps that I'd like to, to make explicit, although they've come up in all of the presentations that have, dis that have been uh, given so far. Um, the first gap that I always notice when I'm talking about privacy technologies is this difference between the focus on data anonymization, the things that I would think fit most directly into um, the data protection consideration, and uh, the form of data protection that is considered by things like the Tor project, where you're talking about traffic analysis, um, about uh, resistance to state surveillance, you're talking about that, that kind of issue. And in fact, <coughs> the, uh, the second gap I would focus on is um, the, 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 the distinction between Again, the gathering of personal data is used by corporations, um, the information we are sharing with Google, the information we're sharing with Facebook, and the NSA revelations that we've talked about. And when I started thinking about what I was going to say today, one of the first things I thought was, oh, am I, am I allowed to talk about state surveillance? Am I allowed to talk about the broader scope? Or should I keep this to a much more um, data protection focused level? But I think that what the, um, the NSA revelations and particularly the PRISM program show is that data protection and state surveillance uh, are increasingly becoming a single issue. Um, the PRISM program, for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with those revelations, was the aspect of the um, NSA surveillance that involved just going to Google and subpoenaing them for information, getting hold of information there. So the data protection issues aren't necessarily framed entirely around just our control of data when we share it with corporations. It does move over into larger societal issues of, of what the government can do with you. One thing that um, Rob brought up very, very um, briefly, which I think is also a very useful gap to look at, is the, um, the difference between conceptions of privacy or major philosophical approaches to privacy and 
when we consider sitting here in Europe, um, the, the version of privacy that we consider here, we're talking very much about data protection, we're talking very much in a human rights framework, and there's a wonderful paper, if anyone isn't familiar with it, by uh, a scholar from Yale called James Whitman, which is called The Two Western Cultures of Privacy, um, which examines from a legal framework the difference between uh, the European conception of privacy and the US conception of privacy. Um, in US, based on the Brandis and Warren um, doctrine, uh, the conception of privacy is very much this right to be let alone, freedom from state interference. Uh, that's, that's the focus on, of privacy there. Um, in Europe, the framing appears to be far more on concepts of human dignity. It treats, as we all know, personal data more as a personal property issue that we can control and main control over. And I think that when we talk about developing technologies through international organizations such as the IETF, the IAB, the W3C, we need to consider which version of privacy we're pushing towards. Which version of privacy are we implementing in our, in our technological models? Um, so, for, you know, from the tool side, I think we need to consider that we need to have some kind of model that brings into account the privacy enhancing technologies such as, as, as Tor that are aiming at, at protecting our traffic from, from surveillance at a, at a state level or an ISP level. Um, but then we need to start also looking at how we can move that model to incorporate the, the anonymization of data models, k-anonymity, differential privacy, and things like that, and how we can implement those when we're developing technologies. Um, I think the, the final thing I would want to say on a, more, on a more practical privacy engineering basis is some experience I have from working with um, particularly two EU uh, surveillance projects where we were trying to provide privacy advice from the very beginning and trying to include privacy you know, throughout the development of what was potentially a very privacy invasive technology. And again, the, the gaps here are, are the key. What we found very much, and which I think is very relevant for the development of, of technologies that support privacy, is an idea of what we consider pushing things up the stack. Um, when you sit down to develop a new privacy, um, uh, to develop a new technology and you want to incorporate privacy, um, the, the first point where you should be thinking about privacy is in the system concept itself. Is this system inherently privacy invasive? Is this something that we can, that we can avoid? Can we develop a different system? Um, but people tend to say, okay, we've got the basic idea. What we'll do is we'll worry about privacy at the next stage, in the requirements capture stage. We'll get it there and it will all be sorted out. But when it comes to requirements capture, there's a lot more of a focus on functional requirements. What's the system supposed to do? What's the system, um, you know, what's the customer going to want from this system? And so they say, well, don't worry, you know, requirements capture. We'll do it this at the design phase. You know, we've, we've got the requirements, but we'll put privacy into the system when we start to actually design the technologies. Um, when you start looking at the design of the technologies, a similar sort of thing happens. Oh, am I out of time? Okay. okay, design, it gets pushed up to implementation. Implementation gets pushed up to usage. Usage gets pushed up to uh, guidelines, and then that gets pushed up to legal frameworks. So all the way you see this pushing up the stack away from where we need to design technologies. So keeping privacy as early as possible is what we need to do. Thank you very much, Joss. And then we move on to our last speaker in the first panel, which is, is Stéphane Petitcola from CNIL, that is the French Data Protection Authority, and Stéphane is uh, a member of the technology expertise team in the CNIL, and he has uh, guided some of the uh, experiments and research in the lab and together with French Research Institute. Stéphane, please. Thank you, Akim. So, hi everyone. So, I will present two experiments that we have uh, done at the CNIL Research Laboratory with two different aims. I, I will try to be short because I've got six slides, but don't be scary. So, the first thing is about mobile. We, we work with INRIA, which is a French uh, research agency, because we we think that smartphones are black boxes for users, but also for regulators. And how can we give some requirements, some recommendations, if we don't know how it works? We have another problem that a lot of experiments just was just done in a lab mode. It means, uh, for example, was journal do an experiment with that, but you just install an app and try all of the features on the, of this app, and after that you stop it and you look which data is accessed by uh, those applications. So we try to do an experiment during three months 
we create an application within Rhea, and after that, we give some uh, iPhone and Android phone to users, and during three months, all of users use uh, this smartphone as his own smartphone. So please, can you go to the next slide? So just to explain how it works, it's not just uh, a sim simple thing because we have to modify the systems. So we change iOS and we hook all of the API in iOS to be able to detect all access to personal data in the, cell, in the smartphone. And we also hook all internet connection to be able to see if, for example, an application access to location. Okay, the application access to location, but is someone gets this location? Is this the developers of the application, a third party? So it's really interesting because it's very different if you look at that at privacy. So we do doing that during three months, and if you can go to the next slide, we've got a lot of results. So this, uh, this result is just for iOS 5, so it's a little bit old results, but we are actually doing the same thing for Android, and we just finished the three months uh, testing. But what we have seen, the first thing is all applications <coughs> of the smartphone are using internet. You will, say, you will say, of course, but it's quite strange because a lot of users uh, install, for example, games, and a lot of games use internet. Why games use internet? Because you just have all, all the information in your phone. Uh, a lot of applications use the UDID, so now the UDID is not, uh, you, can, you can't access to the UDID on iOS, but an interesting thing that we have discovered on Android, we ask to uh, all of actors to allow users to choose to limit the usage of uh, the identifiers for um, different purposes. And we discover in Android, if you choose to have a different identifier in all of your app, for example, if you use Google Maps, you will not have the same unique identifier than if you use, uh, I don't know, uh, Safari or other application. But when we discover, when we do that, we do that to allow users to uh, protect ourselves against third-party uh, third party actors. But on Android, we discover when you install an application, it's when you download it on the, the Play Store that Google gives you this identifier. So Google has all of different identifiers for all applications, and, and when we look at the application, a lot of Android applications use Google Analytics, and when you use Google Analytics, you also see this identifier. What is interesting for, all, uh, for DPA is We've got recommendation to protect users, but we really need to know how it works because when we say, please diversify this identifier, we discover that one actor is able to have all information and it's the only one. So that's why it's really interesting for us to do some experimentation. And a last really interesting thing is, um, you see, 16% of apps access to device name. And we ask why access to device name. On iOS, by default, you will find your name in the device name. It's iPhone of Stefan Particular. It's done by default because it's iTunes that do that. So a lot of applications access to UDID and also to device name. So it's interesting things to better understand uh, how, uh, wh what type of data wants uh, app developer. And Please, if you can go to the next slide. We, we do, for that, we do representation of our results. And we've got, for us, three information really important. The first one, you see the application and the servers uh, with applications and information. You've got the location of the servers. It's really important if you, you want to have a, an overview of state uh, surveillance. And also the applications that, uh, the, um, the data that application access. And just to, to be quick, I just want to show you another experiment that, another tool that we develop. If you can go to the next slide, please. It's an application which is named CookieViz. It's a free application that the CNIL has developed. You can find it on GitHub. It's based on free software. And it's the same thing as Collision and Lightbeam now, developed by Firefox, but it works for all browsers and all platforms. Uh, why we developed that? It's because um, 
We think uh, today is very difficult when we speak about cookie. When you explain to people you, you got a lot of cookie when you go to internet, a lot of users explain to us, yes, but I don't really care. And when you have a graphical representation of what really, uh, what, what your browser send information, what is information sending by your, uh, your browser when you go to internet, a lot of users are really scary. And we think this graph, I just, I think I just browse two websites to have this graph. And it's really interesting because we think it's a good way to present our results and not, not now, but we are thinking to propose to users to be able to block cookie directly from the graphic. Because we think it's, it's not enough to say, okay, you've got this website, this website has access to cookie, but it's really interesting to see where is this actor, this third actor, in your navigation when you go to internet. So, well, I will stop here, but if you want to try this, uh, this tool, you can download it and, of course, improve it. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And uh, give a hand to all, uh, to all panelists. So, um, um, we still have uh, sufficient time for going to uh, the questions. Uh, um, can I just have a show of hands uh, who wants to raise a question or a remark to the audience? Okay. Uh, I, I take note. Uh, is, do we have anything from the chat as well? Okay. And um, uh, I had one question uh, in my mind that we had also in the discussions uh, before, and that was, uh, for whom do we, is, are these privacy issues relevant? I mean, of course, when we sit between ourselves, we think about ourselves, all well-educated Western people in democratic states, and still we are concerned about our privacy, but of course not everyone lives in, not everyone is a well-educated, uh, financially secure person in a Western democratic state. And um, I mean, even in, in our own countries where we have the legal system in place, not everyone has the same means as, as we have, and I think that's something that we also need to take into account when we think of usability of tools and, and measurements. Okay, so we, we just take now the, the question, and I think we start with the one from the chat. There is uh, one question, in fact, uh, uh, regarding the OASP uh, uh, list of top 10 privacy uh, risks. Uh, uh, someone in the chat room uh, posted a question. Is there a plan to separate out risks to organizations from risks to data subjects? Okay. Uh, you will come back to that everything uh, later, and then I just go uh, <coughs> counterclockwise and start with Jab Henk. Yeah, I also had a question actually about the, the, the OWASP risk assessment. Um, hang on, come on. <laughs> because I, I noticed that the, the ordering of the risks was sort of um, uh, significant and, and, and surprising uh, and actually reversed to what I would expect because the top two uh, I could uh, say are linked to, uh, let's say, incompetence of the organization. The second two, I could link to complacency, and, and the third, and actually I would expect that that one was, that was I think, um, item number f five until seven, actually I would have thought that they, those were most important, namely, uh, those were more of a malicious nature, namely privacy infringement um, on purpose. And I would expect that that was the biggest threat. So I, I was curious how the, the assessment of the, the, the ordering of the risks had taken place. Thank you. Thank you, Jaap. And Kai was the next one, I think. Kai Randberg, go to University of Frankfurt. Let me first thank you for this invitation and bring some greetings from Jörg Rück, who is the president of the Council of European Professional Informatics Societies. CPS had issued a number of statements with regard to privacy in, in IT systems and is very happy to see this development um, going on. Uh, now to my questions. Um, the first is I saw quite a few bit of analysis of, let's say, classic PC-based internet in general. Also, the last presentation was impressive on the risk with regard to mobile phones. Uh, what I haven't really seen, maybe I overlooked it, but maybe you can point it out, is a privacy risk with regard to topics of internet of things, embedded systems, cars. All of these um, things where the internet is just covering 
and covering the field. And I think to some degree they're actually very important because they go even closer to daily life of people. And that leads me to a very related second question, and that is basically what do you think actually are the areas and where the Internet and Internet engineering is going to develop very much, let's say, in the next uh, one to five years or so, because that could be an idea to say, well, these are the areas where we want to focus our work so that we can make a change, or, and that is the third question, do we wish to go for other areas that maybe are not developing at the moment, but we have the feeling that and the situation is so bad here that we need to trigger uh, something going on? Thanks a lot. Thank you. These are really very pertinent questions. And Stephen. Uh, actually, I'm partly answering that one. I mean, I think, I think the I think it's definitely the case that having the, the, the kind of data protection people look well beyond the web is is definitely something they should be doing in the next few years. Uh, I think the web is what we have, we have done. Um, maybe not well or not, or not so well, but extending beyond that to the, for the, the Internet of Things or toilets, the Internet of Toilets or the Internet of whatever it happens to be is, is something we need to do. Yes. Uh, actually, I had, a I had a question for Stefan. Um, I, 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 so first of all, I'd love to get a pointer to where you've published, whatever you've published about that. Um, and, but the question specifically was, um, you, I presume you're kind of characterizing things mostly by the origin that's been contacted. Um, did you kind of consider things like any cast addressing and how people are distributing um, services via CDNs when you're kind of looking at mapping to countries or locations? Thank you, Stephen. And yeah, we just continue uh, around the, uh, at the table counterclockwise. So the next one is Hannes. Um, specifically on the gaps, uh, there were two um, questions that came to my mind when I had uh, Joss's talk and also Stefan's talk. Um, I would be interested to hear on um, whether there's any attempt made to identify sort of areas of research, like you obviously had uh, identified this area of research and then you had done it yourself or, or at least uh, subcontracted to university. But I think uh, it would be good to sort of, um, for some of the DBAs who don't have the resources themselves uh, or other groups to identify like what are things that we don't really know that uh, they sort of put forward as a sort of a research again agenda, a sort of please explore those gaps. Uh, and, and the other thing uh, related to that is, um, since you, you talked about applications, um, it sometimes it's, it's difficult to say on who to blame for certain failures. Uh, and sometimes you could blame the developers because they have all these pri uh, privacy invasive apps uh, developed. On the other hand, uh, how, much is, how much are the operating system vendors to blame because they don't provide the right tools to actually pro use or offer any meaningful uh, options for developers. And so that's, for, for example, me as a, as a research example, uh, something that um, I don't have an answer to, and maybe you have as, as part of the work that you have been doing. Thank you, Hannes. So I'm going this way. Anyone wanting to intervene? Pat, please. Into just say who you are. There you go. So Pat Walsh, GSMA. So it was uh, something for Stefan. So, uh, I mean, these issues have been known for five years, and I think the Wall Street Journal was one of those that first highlighted the extent to which apps were exfiltrating data from devices. And I work for an organization that develops on the world's first app privacy design guidelines. And it's a challenge. So uh, I have a colleague to the left of me whose organization has developed guidelines. We have them in Japan, we have them in the US, we have them in Australia. So from a regulatory perspective, it's not working. Even from a self-regulated perspective, it's not working. So I think some of these, um, some of the ways forward, and to take the point raised earlier about uh, on, on the OWASP work, about lack of transparency, choice, and control, is how do you develop the technical capabilities to give people real choice to determine when, how, and if data is exfiltrated. Uh, and I think that's one of the challenges we face, because to raise Hannes's point, um, to work across an ecosystem between device manufacturers, etc., is a real challenge, particularly as we move towards the IoT and the smartphone becomes the, the means by which you mediate your IoT life. Thank you, Pat. Looking further down this line, I don't see a hand, and I look to my right, going down, down. Anything more from the 
from the outside world. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, we have a question from uh, one of the uh, members from the chat. Why protect personal identifi identifiable information instead of preventing identification, which is the root of the problem? Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, Carlo, if you if you say who you are and ask your question. Oops. Hello, my name is Carlo von Links. I'm a developer of uh, Paranoia software. And uh, and I'm from You Broke the Internet. And I, I wanted to mention that we um, worked on a legislation proposal which is pretty radical in the architecture and has as a side effect, it impedes apps from accessing the internet just like that. So um, we might want to talk about that at some point, uh, how we uh, organize that. Like we, we propose a very different architecture for uh, devices uh, where all the, uh, the entire part which communicates with the internet has to be open sourced, uh, free software and, and controllable. And uh, the apps uh, run in sandboxes and have to ask for permission. And uh, they cannot just have a blueprint permission for all times that they can access the internet. Or they would rather really disrupt the user each time they want to access the internet. And so it gets a lot harder for apps to just survey their users. And yeah, it's written in a way that it could be passed as a legislation in the EU and then uh, for the future developers of uh, uh, mobile phone manufacturers, it would just be a fact that they have to respect privacy. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, actually, for those who are, are in the seats where there is no microphones, we have a microphone standing there on the, on the side if anyone wants to speak. But uh, I think here I, I close the round of questions and then I... Uh, oh, Jan, please. One, one point to add, since we're in the gap analysis session also, and we were trying to um, brainstorm on threats. Um, one observation I'd like to make, since uh, Peter also mentioned that we want to approach the topic of surveillance is, and partly answering the question from the stream is, um, that the concept of identifiability may not be enough anymore. We have two um, core problems that we don't address with current legislation. Uh, one of them being that um, what even Moglen calls uh, the privacy is not a transactional thing, but it involves other people. So when I give away data about myself, that may be correlated uh, to other people who haven't opted in to give away their data. So essentially, um, I cannot um, consent uh, to giving away that data because it also targets other people. The other aspect is that even if we lose the identifiability, so if somebody collects data about me and I'm pseudonymizes or aggregates towards anonymization, um, that data still uh, entails information about other people that can again be correlated. So these are current gaps that we see in legislation that we don't, aren't discussing uh, in, the, in the technical sphere as well either um, and um, that we should be looking into, especially if we're looking into um, state surveillance. Thanks. Okay, so we have a lot of interesting, uh, no, well, very useful contributions and a lot of food for thought and for the further discussion. Um, to conclude the first panel, now I would ask the, the panelists to respond to what they think they um, have to react to. And, um, I just do it now the other way around, uh, the, uh, reverse order, and I ask them to be somewhere between one and two minutes each. And uh, Stefan, you're the first one. Okay, well, I, I will try to answer to your all question, but if uh, I miss something, don't, uh, don't hesitate to come uh, see me after. The first thing about Internet of Things in embedded in cars, uh, we are using currently uh, our application Mobilitics with uh, quantify self objects. Because a lot of time, quantify self objects use uh, the smartphone to communicate on internet. So we are able to, to see how, for example, a job on or a, a pulse uh, is using the, the phone, which data the application uh, use. But we are not uh, currently able to, we have not uh, modified uh, the system of this object. For example, a Google Glass is based on Android, but we are not able today to modify this part of Android. A very difficult thing for uh, quantify self application, it's 
it's very difficult to identify uh, the health data in the network communication because you don't know what is the structures of the data, how the, the, the application choose to um, create this data and how it send it. For identifiers, it's very easy. You just do a quest and you are able to find these identifiers. But it's, I think, a little bit di more difficult to analyze uh, our results with else data or other data that are just from uh, a captures, for, for example. A second thing about the CDM, um, I'm, I hope I have under, understood the question, but uh, of course when we try to locate the servers, um, a lot of time uh, we saw Akamai, we saw uh, Amazon. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes we have one application we'll, which never uh, send information directly to a server that's owned by the developer's application, of course. And that's why we ask um, what, what information is able to have these actors, for example, Akamai or Amazon, because all the traffic for a lot of applications is passed by a sort of gateway, but we don't really know. For example, for HTTPS, did you have HTTPS from the application to the servers or to just the gateway of Amazon? It's, it's one of the questions. We, we know, for example, for some actors, that's, it's not the case. And um, last question, so how to, to provide tools for mobile? Uh, it's really difficult. For example, on iOS, we developed, in RIA, developed in, an application which is able to block access to UDID, block access to an inter internet for some application. As you, you have um, the capability to choose if you authorize an application to access to location, for example, we do the same thing to, for internet and some of identifier in the form. But to do that, we have to modify the system. We have to jailbreak the form. And it's your question, Ernst. How, how can we better protect users if the systems don't allow us to do that? It's one of the, of the big difficulty for data protection. That's why we work with a lot of actors uh, to push them to add some controls. But I think it's not sufficient because the system is totally closed and Thank you, Stefan. And Joss, please. Um, <clears throat> so um, I think the Internet of Things question is, is, is very relevant. Um, one of my major projects at the moment, we're looking into the privacy issues arising in the development of robotics. Um, of course, what we realized quite, quite early on is that ro robots tend to be computers with arms and legs, so that's actually the, com the, uh, the problems with that. But a lot of the issues there are to do with things like link layer privacy, protecting device identifiers, and protecting location privacy, which are, you know, these are all significant issues. But I think that certainly looking into location of devices is, is something that is, is very relevant there. Um, and that leads on to the question from the, from the chat channel on um, preventing identification entirely. Where possible, that's very nice. Um, sometimes it's not entirely possible and sometimes people desire services where they will be, um, where identification is part of the service, but certainly there could be a much stronger push uh, towards services that allow for um, reasonable levels of anonymity, but there has to be an, in an incentive there. And I think that, in a sense, that leads back to the question about the gaps. Um, between between um, the different technologies and different approaches to solving them, which is that cryptographers want to make new crypto systems, and there are some wonderful tools out there. You know, we've got differential privacy, you've got homomorphic cryptography, you've got zero knowledge proofs. All of these things are out there, and they are being rolled up into sort of packages to develop wonderful solutions to many of the problems that we're facing. But pushing those outside of academia um, into actual development and implementation is, is very hard. And typically, you know, the academics don't have so much of an incentive to do that. They don't have necessarily the skills to do that. The people who are implementing them don't have the incentives to pull the stuff out of academia and implement it in their systems. And the companies who are developing software and products and services don't have a strong incentive to build privacy into their systems, which is why I think you know, a reliance on, on regulatory approaches as opposed to social norms or market-based approaches to pulling privacy into things is something uh, we need to take. So I think regulation to, to force the adoption of these technologies and better links to allow academic crypto to turn into less academic crypto to turn into implemented systems is something we need to, to be looking at as well. So. Thank you, Joss. Uh, Rob? Yeah, I just want to make two comments. One is on the, uh, the stack that has been... Uh, 
uh, mentioned by, by Jos, which was he started with uh, the functional requirements and then the design phase through implementation usage. And what I missed there was there's an extra uh, level in the stack, which is the adoption by society. And there's like another level on top of that, which is, is enforcement. And it looks like we've ended now all the way to the top of that stack and everybody's relying on enforcement. But as we've all seen, we're not really very effective in enforcement. We're trying to make an everything coordinated approaches, but only against like the biggest players. The whole long tail industry is not being addressed at all. Um, and so my aspiration is to push back on that stack and try to restore trust uh, in society, and, uh, which is necessary and could be accomplished through uh, transparency, but also in the usage of new technology that's, that's coming up. And therefore, we need to look at implementation and go further down in the design phases. And perhaps there's a shortcut to functional requirements, but I doubt whether a shortcut is possible. I really think we need to go through all the steps first uh, to go down the stack. So that's my first point. The second point uh, reflects more to what Stefan has been uh, talking about. Um, as an investigator at the DPA, I'm in a very luxury situation because we have the law behind us to go and visit uh, companies and to look at this, their servers and to look what's in the data flows. For an academic, it's very difficult to do uh, lab research or desk research and to see what data is being captured from our mobile device, for instance, or from my browser and ends up somewhere in a touch point. Um, so what I want to say is, the data that ends up on an end user device and leaves the end user device is just the tip of the iceberg of the information and the data flow that's happening. Most of it is generated after it hits the surface there. It's where it's getting mixed with other information, where it's being correlated. I heard the word there as well. Um, and the reason why I mention this is I only focus in my research on the uh, advertising ecosystem. And on the ad exchanges, you now see a network of ad exchanges. And so this happens with every technological revolution. Um, it, it establishes a new network between the technologies that's being introduced. So uh, the network in itself creates the free flow of data. And we're, we're not really are able to look at the data that's flowing between the companies because the only means we have now are the end user devices. And, and they're just there to basically understand and to trigger what we're feeling, how our behavior is, what our mental states are, uh, such that we can be recognized within that data flow and decisions can be made about us. But what happens beyond that touch point is completely intransparent. And so uh, that's the second point I want to say. It's, it's, a, it's a good attempt, but uh, I don't know yet how to address that bigger data flows. Thank you, Rob. And then we move on to uh, Jens. You want to make some statements now? No? Okay, thank you. And Hannes, you? Yeah, I specifically want to respond to Kai's uh, question about sort of the upcoming technologies and uh, Internet of Things had been uh, mentioned already uh, a few times. Um, what I observe as, as quite exciting is um, the ability or the increased use of internet protocols down to a level of a single chip. Um, so you have suddenly multiple um, ways to connect to a device that was previously not connected. We see these exploits in, in surprising ways. Uh, suddenly it's possible to connect to a hard disk controller uh, and place malware there, even from remote, uh, which one would think, how is that possible? Like, is it, can you swap out uh, uh, sort of code parts in, in a hard disk controller. Uh, and, and obviously we see that with uh, many of these variables like watches that are currently very popular and, and also with many of the Internet of Things applications. So we see lots of um, like code in places where you previously haven't seen code. And of course the security uh, awareness in, in, in the embedded industry um, calls for improvement and so also uh, for privacy related things. But there's also a couple of other technological uh, developments happening right now. There's a new attempt being made uh, to improve authentication on, on the web and, and on the internet in general uh, in, in context of uh, the web crypto API FIDO. So that may have uh, new possibilities for identification if successful, of, but of course it could have other positive benefits 
uh, in improved security overall um, to remove phishing and, and password-related uh, attacks. Um, there's also uh, lots of exciting debate uh, in context of the new version of the, the HTTP protocol and the uh, uh, um, utilization of proxies and what proxies are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do. So you, you see them on a, on a broader technology level uh, uh, developments, but also at the level of uh, single um, uh, protocols where things are reworked and redesigned, uh, including the new version of transport layer security as well. So there are, there are a few things to uh, keep an eye on. Thank you, Hannes, and uh, Stefan, Florian. Okay, I'm just going to answer the two OWASP questions uh, shortly. Um, first, if we plan to separate the risks for users and companies, uh, the short answer is no. We uh, consider it, but we didn't do it for two reasons. At first, we wanted to keep it as simple as possible, because if, it's if, it, if it gets complex, nobody will use it. And we also wanted to avoid, of course, that companies only focus and on their own risks and do not consider the risks that are uh, that are important for the uh, for the users. Uh, actually, we considered in the impact rating. We have a 60% impact rating is based on the user risks and 40% on the company's risks. So there is a bit more focus on the user risk, but in general, we don't plan to separate that. And then the second question about the the rating or the order of the risks. Um, at first, we have to say it is not really based on statistical data because there has there is no statistical data about that. So it's an expert rating. Of course, that can have an influence, and and especially the web application vulnerabilities that you said. Okay, you might rate it a bit lower. Um, actually, the frequency of these uh, of this first risks was a bit lower rated than other risks but the impact was higher, so that actually led to the fact that it ended up uh, yeah, at the top of the list. But of course, it's an expert rating, so not based on statistical data. Thank you. So we, um, uh, we quickly conclude this panel, and uh, I want to make a suggestion. Um, I heard uh, in particular uh, a couple of issues for further discussion and further work. And one was the question of what would be the priorities for privacy-related development research for the next two or three years. Another one was uh, which uh, technical methodologies would be appropriate. And uh, how do we, what do we understand about the adoption model? How do we actually uh, implement, make these things become part of the reality? These were kind of two overarching, three overarching questions, I'm sorry, that I heard. And I invite uh, people to write on the three flip charts next to the entrance um, the titles of what I just said on the top and then maybe write their names of those who want to participate in that discussion, which we will then uh, continue through the mailing list that we have or other appropriate means after, the, uh, after this workshop to make sure that the momentum doesn't go away. 